Thank you, Julia. So David probably doesn't really need an introduction, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. It's an honor. Uh, David is internationally recognized for his work in enabling leaders to apply systems thinking to achieve breakthroughs around chronic complex problems and to develop strategies which improve system-wide performance over time. David is a founding partner of Bridgeway Partners and was previously one of the founders of Innovation Associates, the consulting firm whose pioneering work in the area of organizational learning formed the basis for fellow co-founder Peter Senge's management classic, The Fifth Discipline. Much of David's work over the past 30 years has focused on enabling leaders to apply systems thinking to hone organizational strategy and achieve sustainable change. Uh, David's book, as Julia mentioned, is going to be available for purchase after the presentation. So uh, thank you, David, and I'll turn it over to you. I want to start off. Well, a lot about systems is about feedback. <laughs> How many of you think an organization or a social system has a life of its own? Right? You know, it, you're, you're going to provide your input, and then it's going to do what it wants. Thank you very much for your input. So we'd like to get to the point where you can learn to work a little bit more consciously with the forces at play in a social system, in an organization, instead of unconsciously work against those forces. Now, how do we go about doing that? Well, the key is right here. Uh, well, watch where that thing lands. We'll probably need it. There is this sense that we have that things are connected to each other, but we don't quite know how they're connected or what to do about the fact that they're connected. So systems thinking, in, in very important ways, is about understanding non-obvious connections and learning to create connections that are more productive for the system as a whole. What I'd like to do uh, in the brief time that we have together is, first of all, talk a little bit about understanding why good intentions are not enough. And from there, to distinguish conventional thinking from systems thinking. Learn a few basic systems thinking tools, see how those tools apply to the challenges of ending homelessness and reducing inequity, both um, economic and social inequity, and summarize when and how to apply systems thinking. So that's what we'll focus on. I also want to make sure that there is time for um, conversation at the end. And as we go along, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise them as well. So why good intentions are not enough? The following headlines come from stories that are essentially all true stories. In the news, homeless shelters perpetuate homelessness. Drug busts increase drug-related crime. Food banks contribute to food deserts. Get tough prison sentences fail to reduce the fear of violent crime. Job training programs increase unemployment. What's going on? Think about it for a moment. Turn to someone sitting next to you and consider what do these stories have in common. Take a moment.
take about another minute. Okay, <clears throat> so what did you identify? What do these stories have in common? Good intentions, bad outcomes, great. What else? Yes. Solutions make the problem worse, yeah. Okay, any others? Yes. Can't tell the whole story in a headline. <laughs> I sometimes liken uh, systems thinking to narrative therapy, actually. I mean, you're, you're telling narratives, very human narratives, that go underneath those headlines. So that's a very good observation. Any others? Yes. Yes. So the solutions become the problem or part of the problem. Okay. So let's take a look at a, a list that includes a lot of yours. Failed solutions have common characteristics. First of all, they address symptoms versus underlying problems, which is part of the reason that they, the problems come back. They work. Those solutions work in the short run. We're not stupid. They work. But they work in the short run. And those short-term gains are undermined by the long-term impact of those very same actions. The negative consequences, for the most part, are unintentional. Yes, there is evil in the world, but for the most part, people are trying to do the right thing. And if the problem recurs, we don't see our responsibility for the problem. We're all about the solution. They're about the problem. But as Bill Torbert, who used to teach at Boston College, said, if you are not aware of how you're part of the problem, you actually can't be part of the solution. Uh, Lewis Thomas was a medical essayist, and he wrote the following. When you're confronted by any complex social systems, system with things about it that you're dissatisfied with and anxious to fix, you cannot just jump in with the hope, with much hope of helping, and set about fixing with much hope of helping. This is one of the sore discouragements of our time. We want to jump in, we want to fix things, but more often than not, we either make them worse, or somehow the way the system responds to what we do neutralizes those good intentions that we have. And he said, if you want to fix something, you're first obliged to understand the whole system, which sounds like a monumental task. And you actually don't have to quite go that far, thankfully, to get some real value. But it does help in understanding how a system works to distinguish conventional thinking from systems thinking. Now, First of all, just some simple definitions. A system 
as defined by Danella Meadows, who was an outstanding systems thinker. She's called an interconnected set of elements that is coherently organized in a way that achieves something. This is a brilliant systems thinker, and the best she can come up with the end of the sentence is something? What's that all about? So there is a premise in systems thinking that systems are perfectly designed to achieve what they're achieving right now. But they're so dysfunctional. How on earth can you say they're actually accomplishing something? And we'll take a look at an example of what that, what that means. So systems thinking is then the ability to understand these interconnections in such a way as to achieve a desired purpose, not the purpose necessarily that the system is already achieving. So distinguishing conventional from systems thinking. Conventional thinking is what we learned in school for the most part. It tends to be linear. If I have a cut on my hand, I put a Band-Aid on and I'm done. But systems thinking, nonlinear, takes time to lay into account, and you would think that's really esoteric stuff. I am here to assure you it is child's play. How many of you, when your kids were growing up, found yourself picking up after your kids? Okay. Let me, I've done this with my son, Jonathan. Let me show you how it works. Jonathan! Pick up your clothes. <laughs> Jonathan, pick up your clothes. I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> <sighs> Into the hamper, which is about six feet from his room. Jonathan comes in. No, oh, that worked. <laughs> Nonlinear, time delay. We know it. As kids, we actually tend to get it educated out of us. So let's get it back in. Conventional thinking, the connection between the problems and their underlying causes, or the symptoms, their underlying causes, is obvious and easy to trace. In complex systems, the relationship between problems and their causes is indirect and not obvious. Conventional thinking, when things don't work, it's because others, either within our organization or outside our organization, somewhere else in the system, are screwing it up. We're doing the right thing. They're holding us back in some ways. Systems thinking starts with the premise that we unwittingly create or contribute to the very problems that we're trying to solve. Now, the value of that viewpoint is that it allows us to empower ourselves. It's not to turn the blame from out there to turn the blame in here. It's about recognizing that the greatest leverage we have initially in a complex system is with ourselves and our own organizations. What's our intentions? What's our thinking? What's our behavior? And how do we change that and from that create the ripple effects that we're looking for? Conventional thinking, if it works in the short term, it'll work in the long term. In reality, most quick fixes have unintended consequences, and those consequences are neutralize the benefits of that short-term improvement or actually make things worse over time. Conventional thinking, if you want to optimize the whole, you optimize the parts. And in systems thinking, if you want to optimize the whole, you optimize the relationships among the parts. 
What do you do? What's the solution? Well, often, if you're in a nonprofit, but it can be true in business as well, whatever we can do, as much as we can do, as quickly as we can do it. But systems don't respond that way. Systems respond by the principle of leverage. That there's only a few key coordinated changes sustained over time that begin to shift that system in the direction that we want it to move. So some very significant differences. That's the verbals. Years ago I read this um, training manual and the, the head of the, the front of the communications chapter, they all had little quotes was first you give them their verbals, then you give them their nonverbals. So here are the nonverbals. The expert problem solver. Right? I get I get my problem solved in my part of the system. But of course there are all these ripple effects. They can affect different stakeholders. They can play out sometimes over years until that last domino falls. Now, which way is that person facing? Away from the dynamics. They don't see the dynamics that they're producing. And what happens when the last domino falls? There's two possibilities. What do you think they are? Say what? Crush him, okay? If he's still in the chair, it crushes him. And who does he blame for being crushed? The last domino, right? I've, I'm doing my job just fine. Somebody else is screwing me over. There's another possibility. That person is no longer in the chair. Where are they? Say what? They're creating the next problem, and moreover, they got promoted. <laughs> right? They got promoted because they're so good at doing that. Right? Visionary leadership. How many of you believe in the power of visionary leadership? Right? I do. But there's a missing part to visionary leadership. I've got it too, Omar, a strange feeling like we were just going in circles. Aren't they looking out at the horizon? Don't they have that vision of possibility? What's missing? They don't understand the structure of the system that they're trying to lead. You need both. You need to have the vision, but you also need to have the understanding of the way things are currently structured. And finally, this one. Sure glad the hole isn't in our end. Right? We're all in the same boat here. So let's take a look at some basic tools for understanding structure. First of all, it helps to recognize that there are, in fact, different ways of seeing reality, different levels of reality. And here is uh, Another challenge we face, actually, which is the challenge of the blind men and the elephant. So they're not only different levels of reality, they're different sides of reality. How many of you are familiar with the story of the blind men and the elephant? So most of you. You can see part of the elephant because you can only see that part. You swear that the part that you're in touch with is, in fact, the whole elephant. If you're touching the ear, you're saying this is like a fan. If you're touching the leg, you're saying it's like a tree trunk. And of course, many of us are familiar with this part of the elephant. So everybody sees their part of the elephant and swears it's the whole thing. And then in addition, there are these different levels of seeing reality. And 
that's what the iceberg is useful for, recognizing these multiple levels of reality. So what do we know about icebergs? Why would we use that as a metaphor? Yeah. Most of it's underneath, and it's the part that's underneath that's going to get you, right? So what do we tend to get drawn by? What do we focus on, and what do we do as a result of what we focus on? We focus on events, things that happen at particular points in time. 95% of what we read in the newspaper is events, what happened yesterday. Events usually come in the form of crises or fires that we have to put out. And so in the face of these events, our tendencies and what we can do is to react and try to firefight, put out the fire. Occasionally, and you'll see this occasionally in the newspaper too, you step back from the individual events and you start to see that the events are not disconnected from each other. They're part of some trend or pattern that's been unfolding over time. So now we can look at reality in terms of trends and patterns. And if we can see a trend or pattern, how something's unfolding over time, if we're lucky, we can anticipate what might happen next and forecast into the future. However, often those forecasts are wrong. And if the trend is moving in the wrong direction, telling ourselves, oh yeah, I can see things are about to get even worse, is not very reassuring. We'd like to actually be able to influence that trend or pattern and redesign what is creating it. And that's what leads us to an understanding of what's called system structure. The forces or pressures at play in the system. And they include things like policies, processes, power dynamics, but also more subtle forms of structure, like perceptions, the thoughts we have between our ears, and this niggling question of purpose. Why does the system behave the way it behaves? What is it trying to accomplish? If we can understand system structure, then we can actually change the system and create something different. Because it's the system structure that produces the patterns which in, ter in turn produce the events. So if you want to change the trends into the future and the patterns and the events into the future, you work down toward the bottom of the iceberg. Now, this may seem like simply a good idea, but it's actually where the leverage is. Your ability to learn what's going on and to leverage limited resources comes from understanding that underlying structure as best you can. And in order to access these different levels, you have to ask different questions. So at the top of the iceberg, you want to know what happened. Just the facts, ma'am. What's the story? If you want to understand trends or patterns, you ask, well, what's been happening over time? And then if you want to understand system structure, you ask, why? Why? Often, despite our best efforts, are we unable to achieve what we want to achieve? And that why question forms the basis for a systems analysis. Now, what's interesting is when you start seeing those systems maps, or if you've seen systems maps before, they actually are not designed to map a system. They're called systems maps, but the good ones never try to map a system. They try to map the answer to a why question. Why, despite our best efforts, have we not been able to achieve whatever it is? That's all we're trying to do. That bounds our analysis. 
Because if we were to try to map the actual system, we could fill this, whatever that system is, by the way, let's say homelessness, we could fill this wall in about a half an hour, and then we'd keep going. And what would it give us? Upset stomach, a headache, a sense of paralysis and hopelessness. Because ultimately it is all connected, but we have to be able to work with it in some way. And so these why questions frame the bounds of a useful analysis. So one, I'm going to go through two cases, one of which was around ending homelessness. The other one is sort of more of an un, ongoing uh, activity and research into the issue of inequity. So about 10 years ago, a colleague of mine, Michael Goodman, and I were asked to help uh, the county of Calhoun, which is in western Michigan, uh, we're centered around Battle Creek, where the Kellogg Foundation is, and it was the Kellogg Foundation that originally invited us in to help. Um, and they wanted to develop a 10-year plan to end homelessness because uh, they would get some money from the state uh, if they could agree as a community to a 10-year plan to end homelessness. And the Kellogg Foundation thought that we could help most of the activity that you normally see in community building is around just getting the right stakeholders in the room and getting them in conversation with each other. What we, Mike and I brought to the party, if you will, was th systems thinking, not just gathering people from the whole system. And there's an important difference. So first of all, some facts. Calhoun County estimated at that time 250 to 500 people homeless among a population of about 100,000. Uh, there was a homeless coalition that had been meeting for about 10 years. All well-intentioned people and all of them with that shared aspiration around helping people who are homeless, ending homelessness, and most meetings always having this sort of underlying tone of competitiveness. You know, we all are trying for the same bucket of money here, right? And also, there were disagreements. Sometimes they didn't know what the best practices were. But they had the opportunity to receive this money, so they brought us in. And we made sure that not only did we have the public sector, the social sector, and the private sector involved, but also homeless people themselves. And I would say, and I don't know what your experience is, having the ultimate beneficiary in the room is so much more powerful than having their representatives speak for them. So we wanted to make sure that homeless people were actively engaged. This is a typical homeless coalition meeting. You can't really see very much, but let me give you a flavor for this. So on the left-hand side are the different um, actors. The elected official, the business leader, the homeless shelter director, the health care for the homeless director, the funder, the concerned citizen, the homeless person. And in the center are their espoused purposes what they would say they would like the system to accomplish, which usually is in this area of ending homelessness. In the right-hand column are their other priorities, often their unspoken priorities. So for example, for the elected official, yeah, this permanent housing idea, that's a good idea, but takes a long time, it's expensive, and the community has other more immediate issues to deal with. If I'm the business leader, look, it's important for everyone to have shelter. But actually, as long as they're not downtown, that's okay. The homeless shelter director, giving people shelter is humane. Hey, in fact, the more beds we fill, the more 
money we get. Now, how you get to ending homelessness when you keep filling beds is a little bit beyond me, but, and so on. So everybody's got these unspoken priorities. They're actually trying to optimize their own part of the system in the belief that if they optimize their part of the system, the whole would improve. But in fact, it doesn't work that way. So I have found that helping people think systemically is a very powerful complement to helping them just gather systemically and talk together to get over these hurdles. The trends we saw in Calhoun County were that the visibility of the problem had been very high for a while and then it started to tail off largely when that downtown homeless shelter got moved to the outskirts of the city. The efforts to reduce homelessness had increased for a while but plateaued and the number of homeless people had continued to increase. So how could we explain that and what could people do with those insights? So to explain it, I'm going to introduce this idea of systems archetypes. I, mentioned, I remember I very early on said this, this, in some sense, this is like restructuring narratives for people. Helping people tell a story and then tell a different story. Systems archetypes are all too human stories of patterns and traps that we fall into without realizing it. And that we keep repeating until we see the nature of those structures and can step away and create a different structure. One of those structures or stories is called shifting the burden, which I'll explain for the homelessness case. Another one is called success to the successful, which helps us explain inequity. There are about a dozen or more of these archetypes. They don't explain the system, but they do, do give us a leg up to understanding complexity in a way that we can work with it productively. So these are um, common stories, as I said. To me, the, the most important one here at the bottom, they shift the focus from shame and blame to inquiry. Either we're ashamed that we can't seem to get out of the mess we're in, we blame others for getting, into the, for getting us into the mess we're in, instead of inquiring into what exactly is the nature of the mess we're in and what might we be able to do differently with those insights. So I mentioned shifting the burden. How many of you are familiar with this idea of an archetype, by the way? A few of you, okay. So shifting the burden is the story of a problem symptom that people can address in one of two ways. Either by implementing a quick fix that reduces the problem symptom in the short term, or by implementing a longer term, more fundamental solution that would hopefully take care of that, reduce that problem symptom in a more sustainable way. Notice that the, on the side here, on the right, if we were to turn the uh, iceberg on its side and the bottom of the iceberg is on the left and the middle of the iceberg are these trends or patterns, what we see is that the problem symptom over time in this type of dynamic temporarily goes down when we implement the quick fix, but because we implement the quick fix and the problem symptom goes down, we reduce our motivation to implement the fundamental solution. Why bother to do something that takes longer, takes more money, when we can take care of it through this quick fix? So when the problem symptom goes down, we don't implement the long-term solution. We convince ourselves out of it. And when we don't implement the long-term solution, the problem symptom comes back. 
but a little bit worse than the first time. But we don't really notice that. So we have the same choice. Do we implement the quick fix or the fundamental solution? Quick fix works. Maybe we just need to do a little more of it. So we implement the quick fix again. Sure enough, the problem symptom goes down. We pat ourselves on the back or on the mic. And it comes back again because we don't implement the fundamental solution. And so on and so it goes, and then it's even worse. Because the more and more we depend on the quick fix, it actually builds up a set of side effects that undermine our actual ability to implement the long-term solution, even if we wanted to. So not only have we reduced our motivation to implement the long-term solution, we've actually undermined our ability to implement the long-term solution. The other name for this dynamic, shifting the burden, means shifting the burden to the quick fix. When I picked my clothes up, when I picked Johnson's clothes up for him, the shifting the burden has effectively gone to me. I'm the quick fix in that system. Another term for that is addiction. This is the core dynamic of any type of addiction. Now, what on earth does any of this have to do with homelessness? So here's, the, here's another way of describing the dynamic. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. I mean, if you only implement the long-term solution, people might not be around to talk about it. You know, they might not be able to survive in the short term. But if you just focus on the short term and you ignore the long term, you're also stuck. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. And in most of these systems, it's hard to go cold turkey on the quick fix. But be that as it may, what does this have to do with homelessness? What we learned, what Mike and I learned about at the time was the irony of temporary shelters. So the number of homeless people and the more fundamental solution that was beginning to be known at the time is much more commonly understood now is housing first, permanent house housing, critical support services for people who needed employment for those who can get it. But that takes a long time. So the quick fix is temporary shelters and emergency supports. They reduce homelessness in the short term. But again, when homelessness goes down in the short term, so does the motivation to implement that expensive, longer term fundamental solution. And over time, there was a buildup of side effects from depending on temporary shelters and supports that actually undermine the system's ability to implement the more permanent solution. What I'd like you to do is take a moment, think about it, and turn to a partner. What do you think happens when the system starts depending on temporary shelters? How on earth does that actually undermine the ability of people to end homelessness and implement these more permanent solutions? Think about it for a moment. And turn to somebody.
Okay, take about another minute. Okay, so wind up your conversations, and what do you think one has to do with the other here? What is providing shelters and emergency supports, how does that actually undermine the fundamental solution here? What were your conversations? Yeah. Yes, right. So part of it is a visibility problem. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, and also the visibility issue. Good. Yeah. Right. It actually makes it worse. Not not just. It's not just a benign solution. It actually makes things worse. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yes, sir. Yes. Reinforced stereotype disempowers them. Yes. Yes, so it also focuses the problem that way. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. So I'll, g I'll take one more and then I'll show you what at least we found in Calhoun County. Yes. Yes. So n literally not having an address is very serious, both practically and emotionally. Good. So the way this played out in Calhoun County, some of what uh, you identified <coughs> is the visibility one. So the shelters hide the problem. And when the problem is hidden, the pressure to make more fundamental shifts and more fundamental investments goes away. And the other thing that happens and also happens in other social problems is that you create an industry. In this case, the shelter industry. So remember I said the shelters get rewarded based on the number of beds they fill? If you're a shelter provider, you want to be able to fill those beds. That's how you get paid. And up here in the upper right hand corner, donor pressure for short term results. The donors like it too. Their board members get to see that their well-intentioned money is being well spent because they are housing the homeless. So as a result of, these de of this dependency, there's more funding going to those organizations. When they get funding to do what they already do, their motivation, the time that they have available, the money they have available to invest in a more fundamental solution, go down. And when that goes down, so does the ability to implement permanent housing, critical services, and unemployment. So that's what they found in Calhoun County. Um, what about the mental models here? So remember I said perceptions are a critical part of system dynamics. You can literally add the mental models, the perceptions, to the diagrams. And it often brings them to life. So for example, the public officials. Why doesn't homelessness lead to more of the fundamental solution? 
Well, with the public officials say, look, it might be best practice, but it's too hard, takes too long, and it's too expensive. Or if you're a shelter provider, why do we keep feeding this? Look, we have to help people now. It's the humane thing to do. How do you argue with that? The public around this visibility thing. What problem are you, what, what's the problem here? We have more pressing needs. The service providers again. Look, we have to protect our own funding. And the donors, our board expects results. All of those perceptions keep and kept that dynamic alive in that community. Now, what about this curious question of purpose? Remember I said at the outset, systems are perfectly designed to achieve what they're achieving right now. What on earth is this system achieving? Well, one thing it's achieving is helping people feel good about helping people who are homeless. You feel good that you've been able to help them out, give them a, a roof over their head. You reduce the visibility of the problem. That's not bad. You reduce the severity of the problem. At least they're not out on the street. And you get funding for what you're doing. Hey, you've got budgets, you know, budgets. I've got employees to, to pay. So there are plenty of benefits to the current system, none of which are ending homelessness. If the intention is to end homelessness, then you have to create a different system. If the intention is to do all those things on the left-hand side, you're golden. You don't have to do anything. So a critical part of this work is helping people see the difference between their espoused purpose and the actual purpose, the current benefits that the system is achieving. And encouraging people, challenging people to make a choice. So what were the leverage points in this situation, those few things that they could do differently? One was to reduce and reframe shelter use. So you can't necessarily eliminate shelters entirely, but you can reframe what they're there for to serve as temporary transitional points to more permanent housing. And you can also, over time, hopefully reduce the actual number of shelters. You need to be able to cultivate and motivate to create sustained motivation toward the more fundamental long-term solution through a vision, in this case, of housing first and invest, investing in supportable housing, affordable housing with support services, which is those elements formed the basis of the strategic plan that they developed that was then subsequently approved by the state for funding. So what happened? The plan, in fact, did get funded. Amazing thing happened the next time that HUD money came through the community for homelessness issues to the Homeless Coalition. The Homeless Coalition unanimously agreed to put the funding toward the one shelter in town that actually was providing and working as a transitional housing organization rather than a plain shelter. They collectively agreed to that. This work started in 2006. First six years of operation were 2007 through 2012, which included the economic collapse of 2008. And the county reported the following results. During those six years, homelessness decreased by 14%. In some ways, not a, a huge amount, but despite a 34% increase in unemployment and 7% increase in eviction. So that's one story. The other one I want to quickly talk about is inequity. Um, a lot of projects that I've gotten involved in in recent years have to do with inequitable uh, access to resources such as K through 12 education, early childhood development, public health, and what can be done about that. 
Now, another, so some of the statistics around this, and I'm sure you're familiar with some of these. Uh, the share of total income earned by the top 1% of families in the U.S. exceeds 20%. The share of total household wealth owned by the top one-tenth of a percent is 22%. The wealthiest 160,000 families own as much wealth as the poorest 145 million families. And wealth is about 10 times as unequal as income. So wealth including capital assets, housing, stocks, all the rest of it. The trend since 1970, actually it was around in the 70s, more significantly at the beginning of the Reagan era, Reagan era when there was a significant break between the um, the wealth uh, or the income gains by the bottom 20th percentile and the uh, top 95th percentile. So essentially since around 1980 or so, uh, income has remained flat for the bottom 20th percentile, increased by 60% for the top 95th percentile. So that's an example of trends. The underlying structure in part is due to a dynamic called success to the successful, aka the rich get richer and the poor get poor. This is a tendency in all societies, by the way. This is not just a capitalist problem. This occurs in communist societies, it occurs in tribal societies, traditional societies, agrarian societies. There is a tendency for power and wealth to accumulate and get concentrated in a small part of the population. Doesn't mean it's good, it just means that it's a common dynamic. So basically what it means is at any point in time, resources can be allocated to A, group A versus group B. If group A gets a leg up for some reason, in terms of the amount of resources they start with, they're likely to be more successful. If they're more successful, they have opportunities to generate even more resources, which leads them to get more resources, become more successful, generate more resources, get more resources, and so on. It's a virtuous cycle. Things get better and better if you're in group A. However, if you're in group B, you start off with fewer resources, which means you're less likely to be successful, which means you're going to have fewer opportunities to generate more resources, which means you're going to have fewer resources, be less successful, have fewer opportunities to generate. So what's interesting about, so it's a vicious cycle for group B. Often we say, you know, we know about the importance of equal opportunity. Opportunity breeds success. What those, uh, those of us often who are more successful forget is that success also breeds opportunity. It's not a one-way street, it's a two-way street. And it works in our favor if we're somewhere at the top, and it works against those who are somewhere at the bottom. Now those resources, by the way, could include housing, health, education, money, capital assets, social connections, political influence, self-image, how others view us. All of those are resources. Problem with the dynamic is that it can undermine the moral fabric of a society. Over time, it destroys its economic viability, its political viability. If you want to take a look at the 2016 presidential campaign, you've got Bernie Sanders on the left and white Trumpians on the right of this. Okay. 
in terms of expressing concerns. Sanders expressing concerns about the rich getting richer, whites who have been left out, blue collar whites typically, who have been left out of the economic growth because of the industries that they're in. Finally, seriously raising their own concerns and anger. So the core challenge of economic inequity is basically that dynamic with a little bit more added to it, which is when we have access as advantaged people to more resources, there tend to be two side effects in addition to our ability to generate more resources down the road through campaign financing laws, corporate welfare types of programs, et cetera. Lots of ways that we can hold on to what we got. From a mental mindset perceptual point of view, there is something else going on. One, when we're successful, we tend to assume we're successful because we're better than they are. And that could be, you know, p marginalized people of color or those poor white trash uneducated people in Appalachia. It doesn't have to be just uh, an ethnic issue, although often it is. So we justify ourselves. We have more because we are better. Not because we're just damn lucky. And the opposite side of the coin also is something that we experience, which is the fear of loss. I've got more, and if I've got more, it can get taken away from me, and therefore I better hold on to it. So both of those, the opposites. As a result of self-justification and fear of loss, we tend to segregate and keep ourselves away from the other. You know the hardest part of that homelessness project for me was talking to homeless people. I had never spoken with a homeless person. I would always pass them by. I don't want to become like them. If I get too close, maybe I'll become like them. They were human beings. But I actually didn't know that until I got involved in this project. And where does that segregation lead? I want to double click on the right hand side of, these, of the diagram and start sketching out the idea of intergenerational cycles of poverty. One of those cycles, if we start, for lack of a better place, with the ability to pay for quality housing. And I don't mean just the housing stock, although that's important but also the neighborhoods that you can afford to live in. So if you don't have the ability to pay for quality housing, it undermines the strength of the family. There are more stressors on the family, which means it's harder for them to provide stability, parenting, and education support for their kids. When they can't be strong enough to do that, the educational performance of the kids suffers. And that's not just in terms of the content of what they can, uh, can learn, but also their self-image, their social development and ability to connect with other kids who are on more of a success trajectory. Over time, that lack of educational performance translates into a lack of earning power. So as these kids become older and become adults, it's harder for them to generate living wage jobs. Like one living wage job, not three adding up to one. And without that earning power, it's hard for them to pay for quality housing. That cycle continues. And there are others. For example, as earning power goes down, hmm, 
what's happening here. Okay. As earning power goes down, so does personal health and access to childcare. It's hard for people to take care of themselves, to get the right food, to take the time for exercise, um, getting access to childcare, all of which undermine the strength of the family, which put further stressors on the family, undermine the ability to educate the kids, undermine earning power and education performance, earning power into the next generation. And then as educational performance suffers, as kids struggle in school, they're more subject to disciplinary problems, which then is the core of the school to prison pipeline, which leads to criminal behavior, which has led to mass incarceration, which further undermines families. And if these kids are lucky to get through school and they're struggling economically with jobs, again, that temptation to fall into criminal behavior of some kind, which given the death get tough sentences that they've, you know, we've been living with now for the last 45 years, um, leads, has led to mass incarceration and further disruption of families. So those are just some of the vicious cycles. I'm sure you could come up with way more. And then all of this coming back to this issue of segregation in terms of housing, in terms of schools, undermining housing, undermining the strength of the schools that serve those, that population, and undermining the connectedness, the social capital that they can develop if they were exposed to kids who are more on a success trajectory early on. So what do we do with all of that? Well, if this is all there was, if things were just getting worse and worse and worse, nobody would be able to, that, that there would be like so many people who could not survive at all. And the fact of the matter is that people are mostly surviving, in part because of all of the work that you folks do. But how do we do that work? We tend to do it, I call this dynamic treading water, by the way. We tend to do it focusing on an individual part of the system. As you were saying, you know, it's so big, we just focus on what this one thing is we can focus on. So if you happen to be interested in human services, like healthcare and food and childcare and early childhood and parental counseling, you're working on the strength of the family one. And if you are focusing on education, you've got educational programs like pre-K to, to, uh, to post, mentorship, juvenile justice prevention, enrichment. You're focusing on that part of the system. And other folks are focusing up here on housing, on homelessness, developing affordable housing. And then there are other folks down here focusing on workforce and local business development, usually all in isolated ways. What it's like is people are drowning and we're helping them tread water. As somebody in a, a connected with a community foundation, they were looking at upward mobility for their city, said that system is perfectly designed to help people sort of survive. Not thrive, not succeed, sort of survive. And again, these are all our best intentions to try to break these cycles. So what on earth can we do about it? One organization that I've found that I'm starting to talk about, because I've been very, very impressed with them, is a fledgling organization in the poorest African-American neighborhood in Houston. And it's called Pro Unitas, to give you an idea of what's possible here. What Pro Unitas observed is that a lot of communities are some communities are just program poor. They don't even have all of these programs serving 
their neighborhoods. Others of them have lots of programs, but in the terms of the founder, they're program rich but systems poor. And what Pro Unitas seeks to do is to create systemic richness, where there sometimes is not enough programs or lots of programs that are all disconnected from each other. So the background here, the, the goal is to support the development of whole children in one of Houston's poorest neighborhoods. Um, it's a new non-affiliated nonprofit. So unlike a lot of what are called in collective impact terms backbone organizations, most backbone organizations are one of. They're one of the nonprofits in the community. They're one of the churches in the community. They're one of the this or the that. And what the founder here um, did is he actually recognized the need for an entirely different kind of organization that didn't deliver any services at all. But what it did is develop a system that allowed all the service providers to do their work in more effective ways. And so what it does is it integrates the social services provided to children ages 0 to 24, birth to 24, by all independent partner organizations. There are now 35 partner organizations working in this neighborhood. There were many fewer when he got started. And now 35 partner organizations working in this neighborhood. They're all co-located within the schools. So no longer do the teachers and the administrators need to go find out where the resources are somewhere else in the community. No longer did the kids need to figure out and the parents need to figure out transportation to get to those services. No longer necessarily did the partner organizations need to figure out who else to talk to who's also serving the kid. All of that is being developed systemically. And the co-location helps everybody in the system. Um, there's a community, need, community council and there is a youth council, both of whom provide needs assessments to the partner organizations, what's, what do we need, what's working, what isn't working, and feedback to those service organizations. They are establishing an, innovate, an information and performance tracking system for the whole neighborhood, for all those services to all those kids. And they're also thinking about becoming a one-point shopping for fundraising for all of those partner organizations in that neighborhood. That's likely to only happen once they get into multiple neighborhoods. But the idea of one-stop uh, provision of fundraising is, of course, very attractive if you're a nonprofit working in a, a particular neighborhood. So those are all features that they are currently developing. Uh, what they've accomplished so far, and they've only been at this for about a year, is that they have enlisted 35 partner organizations, um, and those were signed up within four months of operation. Uh, they've raised a lot of money. The foundations in Houston are very, very interested in them. Um, there have also been corporations uh, providing money. They've served 400 children so far. Um, they don't serve the same children all the time. Children are supported. They move on to other children who are at greater risk and so on. And the Houston School District is very interested in um, expanding the model to other neighborhoods. And thankfully, the founder is an amazing guy. He is all of 26. He's a Palestinian who grew up in Kuwait um, and has a fascination for systems. And is all heart. I mean, it's an he's an amazing guy. He's so smart and has no ego at all about what he is doing. Um, in one of his smarts, is resisting the um, desires to grow the organization too quickly. 
He really recognizes he wants to get the systems, all those systems working, have a model that is in fact replicable, have the capacity in place to serve another neighborhood when that comes up. He wants to do it, but he recognizes it's too tempting to try to move too quickly. So to generalize beyond that, what I would say from the work I've done is what can we do? One is to increase collaboration among ourselves and think about what we can do collectively, not just individually and also across sectors. Expand our focus to include strategies that are community driven as well as government driven. Structures that are informal, like peer support groups, as well as formal structures. Metrics that are qualitative as well as quantitative. People on the ground tend to know this, but the moment they're trying to make recommendations to power figures, all of their experience goes out the window, and it's all about the formal policies top down that we need to implement. And I did some work with uh, uh, actually a group of early childhood um, developers or system developers uh, in uh, Connecticut. And they were the ones who first kind of became aware of this. Said, here we are trying to, they were asked to design, uh, redesign the early childhood development and education system for Connecticut. They were all the experts. They were hired by the governor or requested by the governor to do this work. And so, wow, you know, you get to, to make uh, recommendations to the governor. And they realized, oh my God, we're making all of the kinds of proposals that a governor would expect. We know ourselves from working in the front lines that those are not sufficient by any means. So they had to remind themselves to expand strategies, structures, metrics. Reinvestment. So we have social impact bonds and investment that are designed to pay forward on results we'd like to see. Reinvesting the dividends, the gains from what we accomplish is also important because how on earth are we going to sustain this work over time? Return on investment. Reinvest your returns. So there is at least a justice reinvestment program going on. In New York State, there was uh, $17 billion saved in Medicaid. And they took $8 billion of those dollars and they reinvested it in improving the system even further. Reinvestment. Something that business people do is something we do with our own finances if we can. We forget about it in the social sector. Challenge prevailing mental models. Now we're moving even further down the iceberg. Learn from outliers. I did some very interesting work um, with an, a county, another county that had a highly bifurcated population. Uh, this was around Vail, Colorado. So the population was all of the owners and managers of the resorts and all of the um, often, not all, but undocumented workers or immigrants uh, that worked in the resorts. And there was a group of people who were really committed to equal access to resources uh, in that community. And so one of the things we did is I, I asked them the question, so think about those kids who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. And particularly think of the ones from disadvantaged backgrounds who are succeeding in school. What makes that possible? And then I said, now think about all those kids from really advantaged families who are failing in school. What's going on there? And from that, they recognized that there were certain conditions for success in education that actually had nothing to do with background. It had everything to do with whether those resources, whether those conditions were being provided in the school or not. Like mentoring, like developing resilience in kids, and so on. There were about four or five of these. Very important to educate advantaged people about the amazing fact that people with fewer advantages are human beings. And that those of us who are advantaged are lucky. And the appropriate response to being lucky is to be grateful 
and caring instead of self-satisfied. Educate disadvantaged people to realize their own potential. A lot of money goes into that. And ultimately, questioning your own beliefs and assumptions from where you are in the system. How might you be unwittingly contributing to the very problems you're trying to solve? And finally, distinguish between those two system purposes. Are we helping people sort of survive? Or are we helping them to succeed? So those are two examples. One from homelessness, one from the area of inequity. I want to close briefly by talking about when and how to apply this type of work. So when to use a systems approach. The problem is chronic and has defied people's best intentions to solve it. Short-term gains obscure long-term resistance or decline. People believe they can optimize the system by optimizing their part of the system. How to use it? Use it as early as you can. As an invitation to people to get those different parts of the elephant, not only talking together, but thinking together. Use it as a diagnostic. Why, despite our best efforts, have we not been able to make the progress we've been expecting we should be able to make by now? Clarify things like unintended consequences, underlying beliefs, the case for the status quo, not just the case for change. Create small successes. You need small successes. Otherwise, you won't develop momentum. You won't sustain morale. But it's very important to distinguish small successes from quick fixes. Quick fixes, you don't think about the long term. You're just doing whatever you can do to try to improve things now. Small successes are always designed within a long-term context, within a long-term strategy. And those are essential. Whether you ever draw an, a loop, a feedback loop coming out of this, experience and whatever else other education you might want to get, you can always ask good questions. And here are some good questions from a systems point of view. Why have we been unable to solve this problem despite our best efforts? How might we be partly responsible, albeit unwittingly, for the problem? What might be the unintended consequences of our proposed solutions? Here's a hard one. What might we have to give up for the whole to succeed? And then if you optimize a system by optimizing relationships among the parts instead of optimizing the parts, you're actually going to have to give something up to get something that is even more important to you. What might you, as an organization, individually, be willing to give up for something that is even more important to you? And finally, it helps to recognize that systems thinking is not just thinking, even though that's the word that's in the term. Systems thinking is much more than thinking. There is a cognitive aspect to this, understanding the difference between systems and conventional thinking, but remembering that reality is not just what people think. As Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. We're kind of very closely identified with our thinking. So there's an emotional component to this work. We need to shift from shame and blame to responsibility. We need to shift from control to partnership. We need to reduce our attachment to the beliefs that we have by becoming, first of all, aware of what they are, testing those, experimenting, being compassionate with ourselves and compassionate with others. 
for the beliefs that they happen to carry. There's a physical or behavioral aspect to systems thinking. It's a team sport. It's something we do collectively. Now, it's helpful, I find, to do some of this thinking in advance of working with a group, but I'm always bringing a, a group along with me, and I'm helping encouraging them and supporting them to add to whatever kind of seeds I might provide. And there is a spiritual component to this work. I said everything is connected. Hmm, haven't we heard that somewhere before? In practically any religious tradition that we grew up with or had since wanted to explore or adopt? Everything's connected. And it can be connected for good or connected for bad. So in the Old Testament it says, God says, choose life or choose death. Choose what is life-sustaining or choose what will ultimately kill you and kill your spirit and your society. How do we cultivate positive connections and weaken dysfunctional ones? And one of the ways to do that is to develop character strengths. A good part of this work is about nourishing curiosity. Why aren't things working? Despite the fact that we think they should, that we should be able to get further than we're getting. Respect. Respect for other people's points of view. Seeing more of the elephant. Having vision. We need vision to sustain our commitment to more long-term fundamental solutions. Without vision, the people will perish. We need courage. The courage to choose those unpopular solutions that are actually more sustainable than all those attractive quick fixes that we can come up with. We need persistence to hold course in the face of time delay. All of that is systems writ large. So um, I'll just point out some resources. I realize we've come um, almost to the end. So there, Schuyler, do you understand it now? No, but I'm confused on a much higher plane. <laughs> so if that's where you are, that's most likely where you should be. Uh, this is a lot to give you in an hour and a half or so. Some additional resources. Um, my book is available in the back, thanks to Third Sector New England. Um, there is a fabulous systems grant-making resource guide that came out recently through uh, GEO, which is a um, foundation association, National Foundation Association. has lots of different systems tools in it. Uh, intended for grant makers, but obviously those of us who live off of grants um, you know, would be helpful to know those. Uh, there are about 40 in that resource guide, and that's available for free through Grant Makers for Effective Organizations. Um, I will now, what I did not put in here, oh my gosh. Okay, um, how do we do this? Um, okay. I am going to be co-leading with Michael Goodman a 12-session series over this school year uh, online. Um, and it will work from this book. There'll be um, 12 one and a half hour phone calls. There will be homework assignments that we will review and you know talk to some of the homework uh, that people hand in. And it's only going to be $349 for the first six sessions. So the whole is likely to be double that. It's going to start on September 30th. And if you are interested in that, uh, it's being sponsored by IC, I-S-E-E. -E, uh, and they are the world leaders in um, software and um, other tools for systems work. 
Um, and I think you go to their store and then go to training. Sorry about this, that should have been on this list. And systems, thinking, concepts is the name of the online, uh, basically distance learning course. Um, and people will be, again, using the book. There is also a self-paced uh, online course without uh, Mike and me involved. There's an eight-module self-paced course uh, in systems thinking that uh, I see also sells for, I think, $199. That will be included in those of you who sign up for the, the full systems thinking concepts 12 sessions. That's all she wrote. Um, 